Welcome to another episode of the C++ Tutorials. This is episode 4. I'm going to talk to you about downloading a different integrated development environment or IDE with a compiler that's portable. We've been using Visual Studio thus far, but today we're going to look at a different environment altogether. Along with that, I'm going to teach you for loops. With that being said, go to a search engine like google.com and type in dev C++. With or without spaces, it should show up a similar result. Normally, a SourceForge link is the reliable one that you can go to to download this. So click on the SourceForge link, wait for that to load, and you'll see this little download button. Now, it's going to download the file. You're going to have to run the installer, which is just like any other typical Windows installer. This, I'm sure, is available for Linux and other platforms as well. Uh, once you run and install this program, I'm not going to do it now because I've already done it, but it's very self-explanatory. Um, so it downloads in Firefox. You'd click on here and you'd go to your download links, find it, and it will install. It will install to a certain directory, to your choice, of course, but the default directory would be under Program Files x86, in my case, under DevCPP. So you find that DevCPP, and you can take this entire directory, copy and paste it into a flash drive or keep it where it is, run it however you'd like. Um, I have mine on a flash drive as well because I like to uh, take it with me when I need a portable IDE and compiler. So let's get started with the for loops using DevCPP. Uh, double click on the folder and you have all these options here. You have a uh, DevCPP executable application and then you have a DevCPP portable. It uh, doesn't really matter at this point which one to run, but if you're on a thumb drive, you probably want to click on the portable one. They both probably will work. I haven't experienced, experimented with too much of this, but I wanted to give you guys an option, so I quickly downloaded this uh, just to show you that other compilers and IDEs will obviously work with C++. Double click on DevCPP, and here's your standard window that opens. I'm going to maximize it. One of the first things you want to do with this particular IDE, at least in my opinion, is to go to the Tools menu bar, go down to uh, Editor Options, and you'll see a whole bunch of tabs here to choose all different types of options. Uh, one option that I really don't like, that's default, uh, if you click on Completion tab, you'll see two other tabs below it, Code Completion and Symbol complete, Completion. The code completion will give you a lot of um, f functionality. So when, you, when you're when you actually writing your code, it'll pop up menus of different functions that a class might offer or a data type. Uh, that I'd like to keep, keep on. So I enable that, but symbol completion really drives me nuts. So I keep this unchecked. It, it, default, it keeps it checked, but I go ahead and uncheck it because I don't want when I put a left brace in for it to automatically put a right brace or if I put a a quote in I don't want the other quote on the other end of my statement to show up my personal preference but you can get used to any way you want and not do any of this click OK thus far we've only done Win32 console applications so and that's what we're gonna do today so you go to file new project and you'll have a window here with a bunch of tabs. Under the basic tab, let's click on Council Application. Name your project, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call it Project 1 because that's the default. And then click OK. It's going to offer a directory. Um, typically, you would probably want to create your own folder. Call it whatever you want and put all your files in there because uh, in general, C++ programs that you create are going to come with all sorts of header files and CPP files, and, and they're going to add up, and you want them all collectively in the same directory just for convenience sake. Okay, new project, open that up, save it as project 1, and the default shows up. I'm going to go ahead and change the um, font size so you can see it better. Editor options again, like we were before, and I'm just going to increase the font size so that you can see it better on YouTube. A little bit better there. Okay, and here's the default. It defaulted with IO stream header already on there on line one. You have your uh, main function, which every C++ program in Win32 console applications will have a main function. 
In this one, it might be slightly different from Visual Studio because it's got these arguments within the main function. Sometimes you'll hear this term as arguments or parameters. Uh, either one, they're kind of interchangeable, so don't worry about that. And integer arg c and character pointer. Basically, <clears throat> what these two are is integer arg c is an argument count. It's telling you how many arguments are being brought into the program. So how many different um, parameters are brought into the program when you first run this. This is not going to affect us in any way for our programs for now. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with that. And the character pointer is basically a character pointer to a string. So um, we'll get into that in another episode. But just know that with or without these, your program is going to run. It doesn't matter. You can delete them. You can keep them. I deleted them just now for argument's sake. Now let's get right into the for loop and go from there. A for loop will actually loop a piece of code over and over again until you tell it to stop. And there's many variations of the for loop. So let me go ahead and give you the basic, the most basic one you'll probably see, especially in academic books and in college type classes. Um, to, so to do a for loop, you would do for, and typically they declare the integer or the starting position within the for loop itself. You don't have to, and I'll show you an example of both. For integer index equals zero, semicolon, index does not equal a certain number, say 10, index plus plus. This is the general format of a for loop. What it has is a starting position. You set a starting position. Then it has a conditional statement. As long as this conditional statement is true, it will continue this for loop. And then there's a increment, decrement, some sort of um, action to uh, do every time the loop occurs. Okay, standard C++, the line beneath the for loop will be what's inside that for loop. Now, I don't, we haven't talked much about scoping, but if I do a standard C out, and I just want to print out the index value, followed by an end line, this will execute no problem. And then when I'm done with my program, I'm going to say all done, just to give you the example of what this is going to do. Now remember, we don't have any type of pause function in here. So what it would do is run the index for loop, starting with index 0 through 10. And then it would print all done, and the program would close. We wouldn't be able to see this because computers are fast, and we would like to see it. So we're going to do a pause as we discussed before. Now there was some comments about why didn't I use system dot or system pause. In fact, this is saying right here in this in this comment, which I don't think we talked about comments yet. This is a comment. It starts with forward slash star and it ends with star forward slash. You can do multi-line comments that way. You can have more comments in between. This is a comment using these forward slash star and ending with star forward slash. But this came already with this little note that says run this program using the console pauser or add your own uh, get character is what that stands for. Uh, system pause or input loop. Now this is absolute horrible advice. System pause will pull in so many resources and so many extra parameters and it's not standard code for Mark, for uh, C++. System pause will work for Microsoft Windows but it most likely will not work for other platforms. Not very certain with that, but if you Google what system.pause is used for, you're going to find forums after forums stating why you should not use this. So I'm going to go ahead and take their advice and not use it. Um, also, if you have a executable that's called pause.exe, instead of pausing the system, it will actually run a uh, the code, it'll run the program called pause.exe. So you really want to avoid that. So let's, you know what, let's just go ahead and delete this entire comment because I don't like that comment. Do not use system pause. If you don't believe me, Google it. You're going to find all kinds of things about it saying don't use it. So this is our for loop. Let's, let's figure out how to run this with this integrated development environment. Uh, typically, I compile it. You can use F9 to compile, and it tells you any errors. 
Before you can compile it the first time, you're going to have to save it. We've already created the folder, so I'm going to just leave the file name as main, hit save, and now you can see it's executed with no errors, no warnings. Don't forget, this is a free software. There could be errors in this software itself. Don't get confused with errors within the software and errors within your program. Okay, so down here is where the errors would show up if you had any. We didn't have any. To run this, you can just do um, compile and run. F11 would do it as well. And as you can see, my console application popped up. It prints 0 through 9 and then all done. And the reason why I wanted to put that all done in there was because, as you can see, the STD cout index has no brackets or has no scope. Other than that, it's the first line underneath the for loop. The second line under the for loop is line 13 here where it says all done. Notice it didn't repeat that 10 times. It just did it one time. If you wanted to repeat all done every time, let's go ahead and do that. Let's add a uh, little bit more scope and area for this for loop by putting brackets in. And brackets will, will help you in a lot of ways. So there we go. We put it in brackets, and I like to tab my uh, code out so I can easily see what's within the scope of that for loop. So, and IDEs typically make things easy for you to view. As you can see, they're both highlighted when I touch one, it'll highlight both. Uh, so both of these are in the loop. So every time this loop goes through, what's going to happen is it's going to see out to the output device, which is the screen, and it's going to see out the variable called index that's set at zero initially, and then it's going to print a new line. But after that, it's going to print out all done and no new line. So we're going to get some ugly looking code here in a second, but, uh, but let me walk you through this one more time. Once you get down to the end of the code, you're down at this bracket, it's going to ask itself, has this condition been met? And the answer is false because index equals zero and nothing has changed in this code to make it something else. By default, when it hits the end of the bracket, it'll do the increment or decrement or whatever's in this third parameter, we'll call it, for this for loop. So index plus plus means take index and add one to it. So zero was the initial. After it runs through this, to this bracket, index plus plus means now index is one. So you'll see the number one print the next time. And then two, three, four, five, all the way up to index 10. And once index 10 is reached, it exits the loop. Let's run this code real quick by hitting F9, remember. I believe it was F9. Let's double check. Execute, compile and run, F11. So you have zero, then all done, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then all done. And of course, we have our um, pause in there. So you just type in some sort of uh, value, hit enter, and it runs. I do, not, I do not have to declare the index within this for loop. I can get rid of the index declaration within the for loop, and I can declare it anywhere else I want. I can even start at a different number. It doesn't matter because right here index is uh, being reset to zero because it's a variable and it's not a constant variable. This variable can be changed. In fact, instead of changing it, I'm just going to leave it with a semicolon. There's nothing in the first parameter which is right here. So when I run this code, it should start at 4 and go to 10 without actually doing anything when it hits 10. So 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it should execute. Let's try that. Now that's F11. You hit F11, and you start with 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and we're done. Simple as that, right? You do not have to index by 1. You can do index plus equals 2 and it'll start with four and it'll jump by two every time. Plus equals three will jump by three. Now don't forget, if you don't ever hit this uh, 10 mark, this for loop will be an infinite loop. It'll loop forever. But let's try this code real quick and show you the difference. So we're gonna run that and we have four, six, eight, and done. You will, playing with for loops, you're gonna end up doing infinite loops and you have, you're just gonna have to close that console application by hitting the X button. Um, to do an infinite loop simply with a for loop, you can actually, if I remember correctly, just put two per, um, semicolons in there and run this code, and you'll see what happens. I might get a little hung up for a second. See how it keeps continuing and nothing's happening? It's, it's going, but luckily I can close this, and it allows me to do that. Now, 
depends on your operating system and what's going on. You might get hung up and you might have to do some alt control deletes with Windows and close the program. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the all done because it's not very pretty when I print it. I don't like it. Uh, let me explain um, another thing in this for loop before I wrap things up. We have index equals four. We have an infinite loop. What we can do is we can put if statements within this for loop to break out a different way. This is not the preferred method. and I don't like it. It is C++ and you can use it, but I don't recommend this. You can actually do things like index plus plus within this for loop and then you can have an if statement that says if index equals double equals remember that's a equivalency single equals will be an assignment operator it'll actually assign equals that or index that number but the double equals means equivalence so if index is equivalent to the number say uh, 15 uh, we're gonna break now remember within that if statement since there's no brackets the scope and rules for that is the very first line underneath the if statement will be the only thing that's executed in that if statement so this should go from 4 to 15 and break and the break will actually break you out of the loop it'll go from the set of brackets that it's in and exit those brackets so it'll begin on line 20 basically actually 22 in this case uh, so let's try this out. Let's hit F11 again. And we have 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and it broke at 14. Because once it hit 15, it exited before it actually printed the next number. So it exited, and we got to line 22 immediately afterwards. There's a lot you can do with for loops. There's other loops that you can do besides for loops. Um, I just wanted to give you the couple of variations of this that you can use. Remember, you're like an artist when it comes to C++. There's many ways to do the same thing. Take this and practice it because for loops are used in every single program. And thanks for watching this tutorial.